Spencer's Ward, the King Point Ward, and we'll be conducting the funeral service today for Spencer Kimball Oliver, who passed away on Sunday, March 17, 2024, at the age of 14. Our state, our state president, Terrell Cook, is on the stand with us today and is presiding. We thank those who furnish the lo lovely flowers we see here today and other display pictures around the building. We also thank all those who expressed their love and compassion and service to the Oliver family in many forms this past week, all throughout his hospital stay. We also thank the funeral director and the services they provided today. And we ask that you please maintain a spirit of reverence and dignity throughout these services. Our organist today will be Sister Adrian Clough, and conducting the music will be Kimball Sullivan. The opening song will be hymn number 301, I Am a Child of God, after which the invocation will then be offered by Amy Woodstock. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Father, we gather united today in love for Spencer and the Oliver family. We unite also our faith to support those who are participating today in this program, that they will be able to deliver their thoughts and memories. That we can complete our our return of Spencer to be. We feel thy presence. We feel the presence of, of our united hearts and those who are with us but not seen. We're so grateful for the tremendous blessings of the gospel. Our hearts are so full. May we continue to feel thy love. May we continue to feel fortified and strengthened by thee. And we sing this in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Well, we, we have uh, various individuals who will be speaking today. We'll first hear a life sketch by Jonathan Woodstock. Next, we'll hear from Amber Woodstock. And after following her, we'll hear from Chase Peterson who will speak to us. We'll then have a special musical number by the youth, uh, ages 11, where we're singing for the strength of youth at best by the Now I'll make some concluding remarks. So we'll go to that point now. Brother Woodstock. Good morning, everyone. I'm Grandpa to uh, Spencer, Rod, Jeffrey, and Andrea, and several others of you here. I hope the rest of the youth, we have so many youth here today. I hope you just think of me as your grandpa, telling you about Spencer. On behalf of the family, we can't begin to thank the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of those of you who have offered your prayers and love and meals and cards and gifts and ribbons and little buttons of Spencer and this blue ties the neighbors brought over and the blue ribbons all around the neighborhood that was so awesome. You'll notice that several of the family members are wearing blue today. 
Those of you who wore black, that's okay too, because Spencer's favorite colors were black and blue. Today we mourn the loss of a life cut too short, and we know there will be many tears. That's perfectly normal. The only way to take sorrow out of death is to take love out of life. And I don't think any of us would want that. Mourning is one of the greatest expressions of love there is. So your tears are just saying that you love. You love. But we are also here to celebrate a young man who lived life to the fullest. And so we hope there'll be many smiles and laughter as his Aunt Amber and Uncle Chase share some special memories of him. My purpose this morning is to share the life sketch written by his family, but I will also include a few of my observations. Spencer Kimball Oliver passed away on Sunday, March 17th, 2024, succumbing to complications of septic shock, resulting from an unforeseen infection. There's nothing any of us could have done. He was 14 years old. Spencer was born on December 11, 2009 in Provo, Utah. His mom burst into happy tears as soon as he was placed in her arms, and he continued to bring joy throughout his life. Spencer found joy in everything he did. He was an avid reader and avid writer. In Spencer's room, you can find a bookcase full of books. I don't know if you have so many books in this room. Everything from Harry Potter to Captain Underpants. <laughs> Spencer loved basketball, listening to music, playing games with his family, playing piano, hanging out with friends, video games, Orioles, and learning new things. He really loved Cougar basketball. One of my favorite memories, and there's a picture on the video of this, of Spencer and me at a BYU Cougar basketball game. And of course, he had to have a Cougar tail. He always had to have a Cougar tail whenever he went to those football and basketball games. For those of you out of town don't know what that is, it's 16 inches of sugar overload. <laughs> Last Wednesday when I went to the hospital, it happened to be uh, when BYU was playing at the Big 12 tournament. Spencer couldn't talk because of a breathing tube he had, and he could nod his head and shake his head. So I said, Spencer, BYU's playing, would you like to watch the game? His eyes got really big and went like this. And so I opened my laptop and held it up to his hospital bed so he could watch the game for a few minutes. And then he got sleepy. So I said, it's okay, Spencer, you can take him out. He had his own lawn mowing business and loved the independence and feeling of accomplishment it brought. Spencer loved people and people loved him. Wouldn't that be awesome if that could be said at all of our funerals? He loved people, and people loved him. His kind, witty, fun-loving personality and genuine smile make him a friend to all. When Spencer got sick, many friends messaged his parents and told them how much they loved Spencer and what a good friend he was. He kept hearing people say he was my best friend. I wondered how many best friends does this kid have? <laughs> he loved all of life and had an ability to make you feel seen and special. Spencer was a loving older brother. He and his younger brother Rod were particularly close. Best of friends or worst of enemies, as they say. But they always had each other's back. The laughter can be heard ringing throughout the house on a daily basis. Rod, along with his youngest brother Jeffrey and little sister Andrea, looked up to Spencer and loved it when he would play games with them, read them books, give them piggyback rides, and take them to the park. Spencer was a devoted son. His parents 
Katie and Steve always said it was too good to be true. He made the 10, ten years seem easy. Spencer had a special bond with his parents. He shared many hobbies with his dad and could talk for hours with his mom. When he got sick, the only thing that would calm him was their voices. He loved them unconditionally and looked up to them in so many ways. He was a great friend and support to them and to his grandma Oliver who lived with him. Spencer had an innate desire to do what was right. One of the highlights of his life was attending FSY. That stands for, for the Strength of Youth. It's a special youth conference they have in the summertime. He was active in his church youth group and loved his youth leaders. He loved his Heavenly Father and Savior Jesus Christ. In his room, you could find on his desk a picture of the Basin Temple. And on his uh, dresser drawer was his temple recommend and for, his, for the strength that you'd look like. Spencer really loved the song the youth will sing today if you choose to come up. It touched his heart so much last summer and his testimony through leaps and bounds. He cherished his family above all else. He particularly loved family gatherings and reunions and being with grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins. Spencer knew that family was the most important, that they would be together beyond this life. He is survived by his parents, Stephen and Katie Oliver, younger brothers Rod and Jeffrey, and little sister Andrea. He is preceded in death by his grandma, Vicki Woodstock. We are so happy they are together again. His grandma, Vicki Woodstock, is my wife. She uh, passed away almost 12 years ago now. The year before she passed, um, Spencer, when he was a toddler, and Katie and Steve came to live with us in Cedar City while Steve was going to school at SUU. Out in the foyer, you'll see a picture of a woman uh, holding a little toddler's hand, walking up a snow-covered street. Every day when Spencer lived with us, she would take him for a walk down that street to the school playground. They would play in the playground. They developed a very special bond together. And I think one of the things that gave us all comfort was knowing that his grandma Woodstock would be there to greet Spencer when he crossed through the veil. Spencer was larger than life. He was six foot two inches already at age 14. It was as if, it was as if his body had to keep growing to house the great spirit within. We are eternally grateful for the time we have with Spencer on this earth and will continue to grow because of the influence of his influence in our lives. We can't wait to see him again. I'd like to conclude with a little analogy. I would like you to imagine the walls to the side and maybe back here were a glass plate window. And you could see through that, see a, a huge blue ocean. And in the ocean, you can see a large sailing vessel with two large masts and white billowy sails. It's sailing away from you. Can you imagine it? And as it gets smaller and smaller, it's still just a speck in the horizon. Someone at your side says, she is gone. Gone where? The ship is just as large beautiful as it was before. It's just gone from your side. And at the same moment someone says she's gone, there are others on the other side of the ocean crying, she's coming. Last Sunday afternoon, Stephen Katie's simple message to us was, he's gone. Gone where? He's just gone from our sight. 
He's still the handsome, beautiful young man. This is not Spencer. Spencer is alive, Spencer's spirit. At the same moment, Kate and Steve message us, he's gone. There were other voices crying out, he's coming. And right in front was his grandma, giving him a big hug and saying, welcome home, Spencer. Spencer is home. I bear testimony about the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Katie asked who could keep it together. I don't know why they chose me. <laughs> but I'm going to do my best. So I am going to be speaking about the early years in Spencer's life. Um, when our mother, Vicky, passed away from cancer, um, Katie was 25 years old, Spencer was two, and two, week, um, two weeks after she passed, Rob was born. <coughs> And so for a time there, I got to be the feeling grandma on our side of the family. And Robin did a beautiful job from the all over set until he met his new wife, Amy, who was a wonderful grandma. Um, my children, Taylor and Hingley, are the same ages as Rod and Spencer. And so Katie and I loved going around with our two sets of twins. And I would take her kids when she needed me and she would take mine and I would be her. They were the best of friends. It was Christmas seeing each other every time they saw one another. As um, Spencer got able to talk, he would say the funniest things and weekly, Katie would call me and just tell me something funny he had said. And so today, I would like to share some of these things and Katie lovingly referred to them as Spencer says. So I want to tell you some things that Spencer said. Three years old, Steve asked Spencer to do something, and Spencer said, no, you killed my father. Steve, I am your father. Spencer, no, you're not. Steve, Spencer, I literally am your father. Spencer, oh, OK, and then he walked out. Four years old. I love when Spencer exercises with me. When did this is Katie speaking? Whenever we start doing squats, he narrates. I think I'm going to sit down. No, I'm going to stand up. No, I'll sit down. No, I think I'll stand up. And it goes on and on, but she continues exercising. Most of these are, or all of these are from Katie's perspective, that is. Four years old. Spencer gave his first testimony in church today. He saw another little boy get up with dad and he had one. Spencer saw the little boy who was his friend and he wanted to go up to he told me She told me he could only go up if he could do it all by himself. Spencer said, what do I do? I told him he starts by saying that he wants to say his testimony and he ends with, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And then I told him to just say whatever he felt about the church or gospel or Jesus. Finally, he decided what he wanted to say and practiced a few times whispering in my ear to make sure he could remember what to say. Then he walked up all by himself, went up to the microphone and said, I want to say my testimony. I know Jesus loves me. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Then he ran, ran down and said in a loud whisper, I did it. And everyone around started laughing. It was really cute and I was very proud of him. Four years old. Spencer is a combination of very stubborn and very sensitive. And if you knew Spencer, that is true. <laughs> it's a hard combination because he fights me on everything, but then feels bad about it after. One of my many examples, I was trying to get dinner in the slow cooker so I wouldn't help Spencer to find a toy he wanted right that second. He stormed over to the fridge and took down a picture that he drew the day before of me and him. He brought it over and said, Mom, do you remember this picture I drew of you with a heart that says I love you? Mom. Um, yes, do you not love me anymore because I won't help you? He opened his mouth to say yes, but then he hesitated, looked down and thought a while, then sighed and said, 
I still love you. And some doctors knew to look by himself. <laughs> he could never hurt his mother's feelings. <laughs> Four and a half years old. A few months ago, Steve was talking to Spencer about baptism. He quoted the scripture that says, A man must be born of the water and the spirit, and told Spencer that when we're baptized, it's like we're born again, etc. Et well, in Spencer's little four year old mind, he thought that meant that he would literally be born again. He would be a little baby and grow up a second time. Steve and I both have tried to explain to him many times that it's a metaphor, and he says he understands. But then he says stuff like this. We were visiting Grandma Oliver and eating Sunday dinner when Spencer turns to me and says, Mom, when I'm baptized and born again, will you name me Clark? <laughs> <laughs> Grandma Oliver and I could not stop laughing. <laughs> Five years old. I made French toast this morning for breakfast. I started cutting Spencer's into pieces for him, but he decided he didn't want it cut into pieces and got mad at me. Spencer, why did you cut it? You ruined it. Me, who was a little tired and grumpy. Because I'm a horrible mean mom. Spencer, mom, no you're not. You made us delicious French toast. And you made us lunch and dinner. And you play with us. And you help us. And you're a good mom. Great. <laughs> He loved his mom so much. Five years old. Spencer, I can't wait until I'm grown up and I can start dating to friend my wife. Me. Who do you think you're going to marry? Spencer. All I know is whoever I marry is going to look just like you. Five years old. We had just read one of Aunt Jessica's letters from her mission, and Spencer said, I can't wait to grow up and go on a mission. But when I go on a mission, it won't be a long time like Jessica. There's going to be a thousand missionaries, and we're going to teach everyone so fast it won't take us a month. <laughs> Five years old. I was doing a yoga video, and Spencer was doing it with me. We were doing some back bend poses, and Spencer says, What? Did she learn these moves from a kung fu master or something? <laughs> me? Nope, they're just yoga moves. Spencer, then why are they so painful? <laughs> Five years old. Spencer was drawing while I was cooking dinner, and he didn't want to have what we were eating that night. So he drew a picture of our family and then drew a big X over the top of each of us in the picture. He showed me the picture and said, Look, Mom, this is how I feel about our family. No, me, I'm sorry you feel that way, but then I saw conflict in his eyes. He was mad about dinner. But he didn't want to hurt my feelings, and he felt bad about what he had done. He started to furiously try to rub off the X, but it wouldn't come off because he drowned the picture of Graham. His eyes started to tear up, and he said in a shaky voice, Mom, how do I get the X off? I don't want these X. Me. Honey, you can't take off the X's because they're in Graham. You can't erase Graham. He still, he still continued to try to rub it off, and is crying a little now. Me. Why don't you turn over the paper and draw a new picture of our family without any X's? But what about the back? Just draw a huge X over the whole picture to show that the whole picture is wrong. Spencer wiping off his tears. Okay, thanks, Mom. Five and a half years old, Spencer informed me I needed to have one more baby girl and be done because big families just take way too long to get out the door. <laughs> Six years old. Spencer started kindergarten this year. I was more nervous than he was. The first day I walked into his class and gave him a kiss and said, he said, okay, you can leave now. His teacher is Miss Holly. She says he is very outgoing and friendly. He immediately like, likes and wants to be friends with every person he meets. He was awarded the school-wide gator for his second week of school for being kind, caring, and friendly. It started to hit me this year that he is not my little boy anymore. He's just a little over a foot shorter than me in kindergarten. <laughs> and is constantly surprising me with his insights and maturity level during the conversations we have. He is also very tender-hearted. I was asking Spencer how school was one day, and he told me that he had PE for the first time. I asked him if he liked it, and he said it was okay, but the teacher got mad and hurt his feelings. When I tried to get further details, he started crying, and, I couldn't, and he couldn't talk about it. Later at dinner, I asked him about it again, and he said the same thing. I asked why she was mad and what he had done. He said, I didn't do anything. I was listening. But there was another boy that wouldn't stop throwing the balls, and she got mad at him. 
I asked, if she wasn't mad at you, why did it hurt your feelings? He said, Mom, remember how I'm sensitive? <laughs> Almost seven years old. Spencer got a new Lego set and wanted his neighbor friend Michael to help him put it together. He went and asked Michael if he could come over, but Michael had to finish his chores first. Spencer waited for about a half an hour, but started getting impatient. He felt guilty doing it without Michael, so he decided to do one small part and then wait to finish the rest when he his friend got there. He was having a hard time getting one piece to fit correctly, and after trying several times, he said, Maybe Heavenly Father is not helping me because, with this because he wants me to wait for Michael. Oh, wait, I got it. Never mind, Heavenly Father is okay with me doing it. <laughs> Eight years old, Rod saw a huge shadow and thought it was a giant. He was so scared. The next night, he was still afraid to go to bed because of the giant, so Spencer offered to sleep in the bed and to protect him and keep him safe. 10 years old, to finish off his birthday. Spencer wanted me to sleep in his bed with him so we could snuggle up and talk until we fell asleep. I'm so grateful that Katie thought to write down all these things Spencer says and he's leaving us with all these wonderful memories. Two days before Spencer got sick was my birthday and Katie had all the kids send a Marco Polo to me and tell me all the things they loved about me. And I watched that Marco Polo in the hospital during Spencer's last moments as my own little said to me. And he said, I really love coming to your house because you're very welcoming and I feel at home when I'm there. And I thought to myself, Spencer is home now. He said, it's heavenly home. And I'm sure he feels very welcome there too. I'd like to end with one last Spencer says that has so much more meaning now as I thought about this since Spencer's passing. Katie's, in Katie's perspective. I, I just finished registering Spencer for kindergarten and I told him I didn't think he should grow up and go to kindergarten because I would miss him too much. Spencer with a sigh, Mom, don't you want me to learn? Don't worry, I'll only be gone for a little bit, and then I'll be home with you again. But when I'm growing up, I'll still come visit you. When you're old and a grandma, I'll get you a grandma sitter <laughs> to stay with you when I'm gone, so you don't get lonely. Steve, Katie, Rod, Jeffrey, and Andrea. Spencer will only be gone for a little while. And he'll come back to visit you so you won't get lonely. And the sooner than you know, you will be home with him again. I'm about to testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's our follow up. Um, my name is Chase. I am uh, Spencer's uncle, and uh, I was asked to share some of the, the many memories <laughs> that we have uh, that have been written and shared about Spencer. Uh, I love reading through everyone's memories and recalling many of my own. And uh, after a while, they um, they started to become difficult to read. Um, as I felt in my heart, I started to uh, started to feel an ache. Um, like all of you, I now deeply feel the difficult absence of Spencer in my life. And uh, I'm going to read a few of those memories in a moment. But um, first, I would like to uh, kind of paint a bit of a backdrop uh, and give some context to, uh, to some of these memories as I was um, preparing these remarks. I'd like to spend a moment talking about uh, the Garden of Eden. And this might seem a bit off topic, but bear with me for a minute. Um, we are first given the account of the Garden of Eden in Genesis of the Old Testament. It was called home by Earth's first parents. And I want you to take a moment yourselves right now and picture what it looks like to you in your mind, what you thought it would look like. From scriptural account, we know that the Garden of Eden was a gift from God. It was a gift that they were entrusted by God 
to take good care of. It was a sacred place. It was a safe place. It was peaceful. It was beautiful. And it was a complete refuge. It was a place of healing and love. It had no thorns or weeds to torment man. And the garden provided Adam and Eve constant, continuous, and sustaining nourishment during their time there. Now with that in mind, uh, an unattributed quote from an October 1989 Yale conference talk said the following, and this is the key to my talk today. It says, quote, Good memories are real blessings. Memories. Memories are the one garden of Eden out of which we need never be cast from. I'll read that one more time. Memories are the one garden of Eden out of which we need never be cast from. Now with that in your hearts, as I read some of these memories written by many of us, I don't want you to feel heartache or sadness, but now instead with the insider perspective that like the Garden of Eden, these memories that we have of Spencer are a gift from God that he has entrusted with us to take good care of by remembering him often. And like our own personal Garden of Eden, these memories are sacred to us a safe place for us to go, peaceful and beautiful, a complete refuge and a place of healing. And they provide us with constant, continuous, and sustaining nourishment when we need it as we move forward. The one part of Eden we can never be cast from. So the first memory I want to share is from his uh, Spencer's uncle, Phil. He said the following, I was excited to spend time with Spencer several months ago where we were able to play strategy games, trivia games, and basketball, all of which he pushed me to my limits just to hang in there with him. However, the most memorable moment came during the same trip while attending the only church meeting with Spencer that I remember. This particular meeting happened to be a fast and testimony meeting, which takes place once a month and allows for anyone in the congregation to go to the pulpit and share their beliefs of God's plan of happiness, his work of salvation and exaltation, the critical role of our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ, and the doctrine and principles of Jesus, that Jesus taught. I happened to be sitting next to Spencer at this time, and in a typical teenage fashion, he had his phone out and was tapping away. I assumed he was texting away with friends, not paying any particular attention to what was taking place in the meeting. Shortly afterwards, I was a little star startled to see Spencer get up and start walking to the front of the chapel. With his characteristic big smile on his face, he walked up to the pulpit and began to share a simple yet powerful testimony of the restoration of the gospel and church of Jesus Christ. Then as he was finishing up, he called out to his friend, as it turns out, what Spencer was doing on his phone was encouraging his friend to go up and share his testimony as well. After Spencer's encouragement and example, his friend did end up going up to share his testimony. What impressed me from this experience was how Spencer wasn't doing it out of obligation or demonstrating his bravery, but out of love and friendship. The next memory comes from his uncle Daniel. One of my favorite memories was spending Christmas with Spencer and his family in Pine Valley. He always had a deep love and enthusiasm for everything. It was contagious. Next one's from his uh, T. Karen and Uncle Ron. They said, one of our favorite members of Spencer was during a visit with his parents and brothers to his great grandma and grandpa Oliver's house in Prescott for Christmas. Spencer was well-mannered, played happily, and was excited as all children are for the time to open presents. But for some reason, he was more excited about what he was giving than what he was receiving, especially in regards to what he had prepared for his great grandpa. Saving the best for last, he got the heartiest of laughter from us all. His special present was a pack of four AA batteries with a tag across the top with the words, if not included. <laughs> what an unexpected sense of humor that Spencer shared bringing joy to us all. I think some of the memories that uh, impressed me the most came from his sea of many, many friends. Um, this one is from his friend Riley, um, and I'd have to shorten it for time, but she said, um, 
Spencer is one of my best friends. He was so sweet and generous. He was always so funny. He never failed to make me smile or laugh. I love how he would always send me funny videos and memes every day. I also love how he was always up for any challenge, and he always knew how to entertain everyone. Um, the next one comes from RD. Um, they just left their initials, and I never asked, but um, RD said the following. Uh, some of my favorite things about Spencer are that he was super funny and, uh, and fun to be around. When we rode the bus together, together, he made the bus ride fun and something I looked forward to. I never felt out of place when I was around him. It was grateful he kept inviting me to do things after we moved. He was welcoming and could make some hilarious joke out of anything he saw. Uh, next one is from TD. They said Spencer was always just so happy and funny. He would say the most out of pocket, random, wacky stuff, yet it would be so hilarious. <laughs> um, I, I always felt like I could just be myself around him. He has such an outgoing and exciting energy that felt contagious. Like when I was around him, I felt so carefree and happy. He would always talk in a weird, a weird British accent that was really bad. <laughs> it was always just so funny and made me laugh. He was such a good example of what a truly kind person looked like. He didn't care what other people thought of him. He just wanted to have fun with everyone. He was so inclusive of everyone around him. And he just made people smile. During youth night, he was always the life of the party. The next one is from Tristan Hales. He said, Spencer, Peyton, and I became besties in first grade. My mom walked me home from school one day. Spencer was pointing at me and telling his mom that that's the kid from school. Then she yelled across the street to my mom so we could start arranging play dates. Soon after that, we started hanging out pretty much every day after school. We played a lot of video games and wrote a lot of stories. We wanted to make our books into a Netflix show one day. Spencer was always a really good writer and had a great imagination. In second grade, we drew a lot of different versions of Marvel characters, mostly Deadpool. We draw him in all sorts of different costumes and make up silly stories. We even both dressed up as him one year for Halloween. We love to collaborate, typically a year in advance every year, how we were going to coordinate our Halloween costumes. And my favorite one, we dressed up as Mario Luigi. I had so many amazing memories of my best friend. That is hard to narrow it down. But one more fun one was one time when we went fishing together. I didn't catch any fish that trip. Instead, I accidentally hooked Spencer by the seat of his pants. <laughs> and I really hooked him. It was difficult to get that hook out. And it took a couple of adults to help release him. <laughs> but I took a picture and sent it to my mom and said, I had the biggest catch of everyone. <laughs> <laughs> the next one is uh, from his mom, Katie. Um, he was the perfect mix of loving being home and loving being with friends. He loved hanging out at home with family, watching movies together, TV marathons and reading, playing board and card games, even though he was a sore loser. <laughs> he would still indulge in mom in going hiking or swimming or sleep under the Christmas tree with his younger siblings. He loved tradition, extended family and hanging with cousins. Family reunions or trips to see family in St. George were the highlight of the year for him. His family mostly or hosted most holidays, but last Christmas it was uh, it was just his parents and siblings, and he was so sad not to share the holiday with grandma, aunts and uncles, and cousins. He caught the bug for reading uh, when him and his mom were Harry Potter together in her bed at night. They were the first one together, and while reading the second, there were some nights that good mom couldn't read, and he'd get so impatient, he'd just read without her. Until eventually he just took off and read the whole series on his own. His appetite for reading couldn't be quenched after that. He read series he loved multiple times and especially loved fantasy books. He loved hosting friends at our house, always with popcorn, soda, and Oreos. He was an extrovert. He gets so much energy from being with friends for a youth night. 
and be bouncing off the walls for a couple hours until he could be calm enough to go to bed. He loved playing video games, and when he was younger, he'd get so excited about the game, he just ran in place while playing. <laughs> His parents always joked he'd have as much video game time as he liked because he got a ton of exercise. <laughs> he was so sweet with little kids. He loved holding and playing with his little cousins. He babysat for a couple families in the neighborhood, which isn't a normal gig for a teenage boy, but they loved him, and he thought it was so fun. He was really brave. He wasn't afraid to, uh, to try new things, to put himself out there, to be different, to stand up for what was right and to be who he was. Those can be scary things for someone his age, but he did them. He loved doing things with his dad, going to BYU games together, watching team marathons. <laughs> Sorry, it's getting hard to see. <laughs> um, playing basketball and football. His dad was a patient teacher, and Spencer was a willing student. Spencer learned from his dad how to get dressed by himself, and ride a bike when he was little, how to do laundry, sports, work on cars and mow lawns and use computer programs when he was older. Spencer and his mom are especially close. They have very similar personalities and just love being together. Um, his mom and him could talk about anything for hours. In fact, many times, he'd be in her room late at night, talking until she was nodding off to sleep, begging him to go to bed. <laughs> he also loved to debate and hated to admit that he was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, um, I'm up here, so I have to share some of my own memories with Spencer. <laughs> and I have uh, many of them. Uh, a couple years ago, Jessica and I helped paint his room. <laughs> That's something I think about every time that we go up there and didn't see it. Um, we play basketball together. It's something we always look forward to, especially when we moved out of state. Um, we always look forward to the times to come back and, and, and play basketball. Um, we always talk about video games, and admittedly, um, it was mostly him talking at me. <laughs> um, but it was great. Um, and as a University of Utah grad, we had a friendly but never-ending back and forth <laughs> with who was better <laughs> between BYU and Utah. That rivalry uh, continues. <laughs> um, but while I was thinking about it, another memory came to mind that has, has uh, been sticking in my mind, and I, I don't know why, because um, it's something that I've long forgotten about. And um, honestly, I'm not sure that I've ever even told another soul about it. And I guess I'm going to tell all you guys. So <laughs> here it goes. Um, I married into the Oliver family almost six years ago, and when I first joined the family, I spent a little bit of time uh, in my head wrestling with myself because I wasn't quite sure how to approach being a new uncle to these kids where I had not known them their whole lives up to that point. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I married their aunt and was magically now their uncle. And it felt a bit awkward and uncomfortable at first to me. But Spencer, I'm really about to, <laughs> never skipped a second in fully embracing me that had been there since day one. <laughs> and we never looked back. But that's the kind of person Spencer was. From these memories, we see what impressive characteristics he had. He made you feel welcomed and important. He had a deep, deep kindness and love. He was funny and enthusiastic, and he spread that joy wherever he went. Those are traits that many of us will spend a lifetime trying to build and develop. <laughs> he did it in 14 years. I miss Spencer. <laughs> now as we move forward, and as we remember Spencer in the hours, months, and years ahead, 
We will likely continue to feel some difficult emotions because of his absence, which is okay and good. But I would offer that set of feelings to heartache and loneliness and hopelessness. Those memories that we have of Spencer and the new memories that we create together can be our own garden of Eden, safe, beautiful, a personal refuge, nourishing to our souls, providing what we need to sustain us in the hard moments, or we miss him. Until the day when Christ comes again and we are reunited with Spencer and all of our loved ones, and the favorite hymn tells us that in that day, the earth shall appear as the Garden of Eden, and Christ and his people will never be one. I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. No, I'm going to you, Taylor.
Amazing. That was sure. Now, last Wednesday, the youth invited practice for that song today, and we all got together. And the Leafs decided to room our board. As I entered the room, I saw that they sat in the chairs in this large circle. And they come. And as I looked around, I began to feel the collective grief of the youth um, that he once mingled with. There was no big prayer that we started with, and I began to feel the uniqueness of the situation of being as well with his youth, and the love from heaven above, as well as the love the youth had for Spencer, and I, I, I could not hold back my tears as an opening prayer was offered. After practicing the song, I decided to say just a few short words and open it up for their sharing of thoughts and feelings that the youth were having together in that moment. Many stories were shared, some sad, some very funny, and some sacred. I was already aware that he had maintained a temple recommend and worthily performed his priestly duties. He had served as the he was serving as the secretary in the teacher's quorum. Um, but I began to learn more. I, I began to learn that Spencer had been living a life of hard work and service from their stories. He was a beloved friend. He was someone who liked to have fun, someone who liked sports. And overall, I came away knowing that he was someone who had touched the lives of many of the youth, if not all of the board, in a very positive way and beyond, I'm sure. I testify to the youth that Spencer's spirit lives on in the spirit world. And we will see him again, that God knows the beginning and the end of each of our lives and sees the bigger picture and has a plan for each of us to fulfill. 
I believe his spirit has moved on to wait for that time appointed for the resurrection made possible by the power of Jesus Christ and his power of death. Jesus, Jesus also was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. In the man who preached my gospel, it states, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, his spirit was separated from his body. And on the third day, his spirit and his body were reunited, and never be separated again, as mortals each of us will die. However, because Jesus triumphed over death, each person born on earth will be resurrected. Resurrection is a gift, a divine gift for all, given through the Savior's mercy and redeeming grace. Each person's spirit and body will be reunited. And each of us will live forever in a perfected, resurrected body. And if not for Jesus Christ, death would end all hope for a future existence with Heavenly Father. I believe this is true. The scriptures also teach us that Jesus shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. And um, I wanted to read, uh, Katie asked me to read something from her to all of us, and I'll do that now. Katie says, Spencer's loss is hard and confusing for all of us. But it is my sincere hope that we don't leave here today with feelings of despair or anger. Spencer is one of the most uplifting, enthusiastic people we know. My hope is that if you touched your life for good in any way, good or small, that you'll take that feeling and do good with it. Look to those around you. So many people are going through hard things. Who needs you? Who needs a compliment, a kind compliment? Who needs service? Who needs a treat or a nice note? Who needs a friend? Maybe the good you do will be within yourself. Do better. Forgive yourself. Forgive someone else. Spencer's life was full of goodness. We know that. We all felt that. We were all blessed by that. So please use his influence to do good as a way to show your love for him and a way to remember him. Close quote. I echo her plea as, as his bishop. Please show your love for him by doing something good for someone else. In conclusion, we say, Spencer, thank you for your example. Thank you, for, thank you for your goodness. We love you very much. We bid you a loving farewell until we will see you again. And we are grateful for the time that we shared together. We place our faith in the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who lives today. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I'd like to thank everyone uh, who participated in the funeral services today. We'd like to recognize the pallbearers, Brian Oliver, Jeffrey Oliver, Jamie Rossler, Torin Woodstock, Rod Oliver, Ben Sullivan, Cody Wasland, and Andrew Woodstock. After the benediction, the pallbearers will stay seated until instructed to come forward by the funeral director. Following the funeral, the dedication of the grave will be for family only and will be dedicated by Garrett Wasland. So we'll now sing our closing song, hymn number 136, I Know That My Redeemer Lives, following which the benediction will be offered by Sister Love. <laughs> Thank you. 